and welcome to Game Changers with Vicki Abelson. That's me. And my guest today is Wendy Waldman. Hi, Wendy. Hello. I am so happy that you are here. Thank you. I apologize for taking so long to get here. I know that we talked about it quite a while back, and I, I'm just really slow these days. It's like, oh, yeah, man, I, I got to do that. Where is that address? <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> you know what? Everything happens exactly when it's supposed to. And uh, the time is now. You're perfectly, you're right on time. That's what I feel. You saw my, my music partner, Sid Bullens, a couple oh. weeks ago. And Sid came back and said, yeah, I met this person, uh, Vicky, uh, and uh, she says she's been trying to reach you for two years. And I went, <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so... Hi, everybody out there. Yes, I do apologize, but I'm really happy to be here. I am so happy you're here. All right, I'm checking the Facebook to make sure that we're that we are we are actually live. Just making sure that they're letting people get to us. So I'm going public here. So um, uh, let's make sure they're doing that. And I am going to. Uh, all right, I am gonna. Uh, all right, there. All right. Because people aren't here yet, and I'm wondering why. Here they come. All right. Hi, <laughs> Anne. All right. They're here now. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes it takes a little while. Um, it's been more than two years, Wendy. I think I actually started chasing you like four years ago. Um, but but that's all right, because you were worth waiting for. It yeah. probably was four years ago, and I don't know that I'm worth waiting for, and I don't mean to come off arrogant. <laughs> oh, it, it's not, not arrogance as much as just like, uh, I tend to get really, I work a lot and I get scattered and then I go through these, you know, I, I'm one of, I'm an artist, you know, no, there's no, there's no excuse. I was just being a, a jerk. I apologize. Oh, no, you weren't being a jerk. You were being, you were being a busy artist and you're allowed to be a busy artist. That's okay. Well, um, you know, when you get, when you get to this age, <laughs> which when I say that, my younger friends panic, you know, don't say that because you're so young. It's like, no, 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 dude. What I'm trying to tell you is that when you get to this age, you do see things differently. You know, not, it's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, I feel like I'm, I've arrived at, at this age. Like I go, oh, I, I'm here, <laughs> you know, which I think I wasn't for a lot of my adult life, you know, but as many of us can probably relate to that statement. Totally. Um, so, Okay, you. So, what would you say are the benefits? <laughs> I'm serious because we were just we were just talking about getting upstairs and the health stuff, and so. But there are things I think that are pretty wonderful about aging. So, is there anything that stands out? Is like, yeah, I this is a gift I have now. Oh, yeah. Oh my God. Yes. Perspective. Oh God. Yeah. I mean, just you know. As much as we're just basically apes walking around on our hind <laughs> legs and, you know, but, but the, the, the minuscule degree of wisdom that you attain mm -hmm. um, and, and if you're willing to do the work to, to work on how you see the world and how you see yourself, you know, you, you get dynamics a lot faster. You see people doing stuff and you go, oh yeah, well, I was 40 and I did the same thing. You know? <laughs> I get that. I was 20 and I did the same thing. And even I was 50 and I did the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of go, okay, yeah, I, I actually do get some of this. That's one thing. And another thing that I'm, that's really hitting me is, you know, I kind of know how to do my gig. Ooh. I kind of, I always thought that artists, because I'm a huge fan of visual artists, painters mm -hmm. and, and, and classical artists and, you know, it, they always, as a painter, you're always supposed to get better as you get older. And case in point, also as a as a composer, you look at the late Beethoven quartets. I mean, he he was practically writing avant garde jazz with those last wow. quartets. You know, and so his last work was was just genius. And and I think you know Dylan's new work is genius. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to get better as you get older. We, we're living in a culture, this particular bubble, where the culture only values youth. But around the world and throughout history, the idea was to attain mastery. And that you don't get that sucker until you've really paid some dues. And I'm finding in my work as a record producer and as a writer and as an advocate just in my own tribe, um, 
I, I'm, a, I'm a little bit better at this now. You know, I'm, I'm happy with what I've learned. And I love this. So, you know, and I'm still learning a lot. I mean, the learning curve, I was talking to the great songwriter, Craig Bickhart, the other day, because he's part of a presentation that Refugees, my band and I are doing for Far West. And, and Craig said, this video stuff is, I said, Craig, when we all stepped out, you know, in 1972 or whatever it was and picked up our guitars and went, I want to do that too. No one told us we would have to become filmmakers, you know. <laughs> And we're all dealing with that now. The technology, you know, what? once we went into COVID, I, I couldn't do a show in the past unless I had somebody to work the lights, the camera and all that stuff. And when COVID happened, it was like, I found out I don't do it well, but I do it, right? I know how to turn on the camera and get us live and turn on the microphone and do the thing. Yes. And, and, and that's so liberating and it's so powerful. And I, you know, we just went through a whole week of technological hell because we were trying to figure out, can we work as a trio and blah, 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 all the stuff that everybody who's watching us is going, I know that one, I know that. <laughs> and, and the thing is that we kind of figured it out. And, and there's this, I mean, we, there's a sense of accomplishment. And I've been taking technological challenges for many years. I had my first private studio in 1980 wow and and have continued on ever since to where i have a pretty honking pro tools room now and and i work with great engineers who are very patient but i can mount a session now if you come in and say you need to record me right now you know it's like take off your bathrobe and put on your slippers and go in there and do it and i was like yeah okay let's let's cut wow that's fantastic and it's been many many years of study but you know, it's super fun. Oh, we're gonna, we're gonna start. We have to come to that, like how you became a producer it's and how you learned all these fun. tricks. Okay, so we have to start at the beginning. But before we get to your history, I, I want to know a little bit about how you've handled COVID. What, what were you doing? Like when I say when the lights went out, where were you? Were you in the middle of something? Was something upcoming that got canceled? What was your life like? In February of mm -hmm. last year, I got no. In January and February, I was enormously sick. Oh, I was really sick to the point that I went to my doctor, who's a genius. And I said, w what's going on? And, and, and he said, go to the ER and get tested to see if you have flu, just normal flu, because there right. was no such thing as COVID yet. This right. is late January. And they said, no, but you're really sick. So they sent me home mm -hmm. with a bunch of antibiotics and stuff and I was sick for a week I never tested I never had the antibodies in February my I went down to Oaxaca with my sister and my brother-in-law and and my dear friend Mietek Szczesniak and my sister got really sick while in Oaxaca and they they tested her for flu we got back in early March I was supposed to go down to the Bluebird in Nashville to play with the refugees mm -hmm. and the, the pandemic hit. I mean, Mietek flew out of LA March 3rd. I was supposed to be in Nashville March 12th. I canceled it. The, the, the pandemic hit right in that week. Right. And there were all these people freaking out. And I just said to them, guys, I'm not coming down. I don't know why, but I, this is, I'm not coming down. And they played that gig. They played the, the 12th without me, which they have not let me forget. <laughs> with Gary Nicholson, um, the Bluebird shut down the next day. Wow. So I was still living in my old house in Northridge and, you know, like everybody else, I mean, this was a year before there were vaccinations. Mm -hmm. And they said, you know, if you're over 60, you're staying home. So I got Instacart and I did all that stuff mm -hmm. and I stayed home and I was masked. And I was very fortunate that I, did not get COVID, but you know. So you don't think that thing you had in January was COVID? I do think it was. You do. Did you, did you have, do you have any long hauler stuff? Is anything, thank God. Okay, good. Or not that I know of, you know, uh, but I, I'm pretty sure it was. And, and I think Jillian did too. And I had other friends and it was, here's a weird little anecdote. When I was sick in late January, the ER, I went to the ER and they gave me the Z pack or whatever. And I guess I went and they said, you have to get this and this. So I went to the Target next door. 
-hmm. and I'm walking through the target and I'm checking out and I've got the meds and everything. And, and I said, man, I'm, I'm sick. And the cashier said to me, oh, everybody's got this. This is like last week of January. She says, everybody's got this. She said, Let, don't tell me you've got chills. You've been really tired. You've been really weak. And then you get really hot and you, you can't breathe. And you, oh and I was God. like, yeah, that's, she said, I don't know what it is. She said, but everybody's out. All our cashiers are out. Everyone's got this thing. It's wow. this weird kind of flu that's going around. And it wasn't named for us out here in Los Angeles, probably till middle of March. So, mm -hmm. you know, was it here? Yes. Cause that was not like any flu I've ever had. And, wow. and I tested for antibodies later and it's like, no, you never had. And it's like, you know what? You can tell me I never had it, but I had it, <laughs> you know, and now you see all these strains that are out there and now they're saying, well, yeah, it was kind of in California in December of 2019. Mm -hmm. And like, of course I had it. A lot of people had it. So I assume, um, I, I assume that you're vaxxed and had did all of that so how has your life gone back back to any semblance of normal no I, i'm one of those forgive me i'm one of those people who made a brand new normal during covid okay so what does that look like uh i had lived in my home in northridge which was a slamming place it was a center for it was a huge recording studio i had a pool i had a spa mm -hmm. I had, four bathroom. I, it was a giant place. And, mm -hmm. but in my soul, I, and I had been there 14 years and in my soul, I was increasingly unhappy. I had plant, for example, I had planted, I'd taken out 10,000 square feet of lawn and planted all native Cal California natives. Cause I'm, because I spent many years living in Topanga Canyon. So I brought Topanga to my front yard, and, but I was the only one who ever did in that neighborhood. And by so the, what, what is native? What, what, what well, did you they, it's like when you, if you go where I don't, you live sort of on the West side, right? Presumably. No, I no Northeast. I'm in, yeah, I'm Glendale adjacent. La Crescenta, La Cunha. Oh, area. okay. So if you walk up in the Hills up in mm -hmm. above La, La Crescenta, La Cunada, mm -hmm. and you look at, you know, you take the fire trail and it's right. all chaparral and oak trees and stuff. That is the indigenous plant that's the that those are the plants that actually belong here not palm trees well native palm trees okay. but if you have a lawn mm -hmm. and you have sort of you know uh snapdragons and imported trees that are really pretty but come from connecticut or from england or something that's not native native mm -hmm. means take us all away what was here what was growing naturally the Indians who lived here, what did they cultivate? What did they use? What, what was the landscape like? And there's been a tremendous movement that started actually a long time ago of, of gardeners and landscapers and, and botanists going, figuring out what was really here and what's the advantage. So like not far from you is the, the fabled Theodore Payne Foundation. Mm -hmm. It's in Sunland. And he, in like the 1920s, he was fascinated with our native flora. And he began studying it and collecting it. And he built this nursery, which is now pretty much ground zero for California native gardening. So you go over there and you say, well, if I wanted to plant a drought tolerant thing, and if I wanted to take out my lawn, I don't mean to bore you guys, but you've got no, me. No, no, no. I'm geeking no, out now. And this is like, anybody who knows me is like, oh yeah, she's... <laughs> You know, Vicky gave her a chance to geek out. Okay, so the DWP will, will pay you to take out your lawn now. They will pay you to take your lawn out. And you go, well, what do I put in here? And, and then these shysters come in and say, we'll put white rock and a bunch of cactus. But there's an alternative, which is that you can reclaim your land. Wow. You can put back what was here before the, your neighborhood. And what happens is immediately birds and insects and butterflies and even lizards that couldn't live on your, your roses, or I'm sorry, I'm a rose gardener too. It's my, <laughs> but your, you know, your weird imported trees and your weird imported lovely plants and your lawn start coming back. Mm 
Wow. They find it because you're planting, for example, the California, the our state bush is called the toyon. It's a, it's a holly with that makes the red berries, and you plant. Really? Yes, that's our state our state bush toyon. It's a native. It's been here for thousands of years. You plant it, and it grows huge, and it makes all these berries, and all these birds come. Oh. that normally go, you know, well, this, this lady's got mimosa plants or some kind of thing there that I don't know what to do with. And you plant these bushes and they show up. A case in point is, of course, native um, milkweed for monarch butterflies. You plant the native milkweed, and which is narrow leaf, and there's a number of varieties. And the next thing you know, you, you walk out one day and you go, oh, this happened to me. I planted native milkweed and I walked out one day and I went damn something ate all my milkweed and I stopped and I thought about it and I heard myself when I went oh, oh oh right right see the butterflies find the milkweed and they lay the eggs there because they can only eat that milkweed of all th they can only eat that so they lay their eggs and then the little baby caterpillars are born and what do they do they eat the plant and it's like and i'm standing there going oh damn man who ate my oh oh my god and then like a month later you see baby monarch butterflies being born Aww. and it's pretty pretty awesome so wow. so have you done this in your new place yes you have. The new place I bought is six tenths of an acre that's like this. And the fellow before me, who was a wonderful Western painter, didn't seem to like the outside very much. And there was nothing here. I think maybe he sprayed. I don't know. But oh. the first thing that I did with my one of my I work with a, a wonderful Mexican Indian gardener. And we we planted on the hillside about 60 or 70 native plants that are growing. I mean, they're, oh, wow, they're a foot now, but we're coming into the season when they start to really grow. So by next spring, these little toy owns with their little berries are gonna be three feet high and wow. it's gonna populate the whole mountain. And, you know, friends in Los Angeles, if you ever get a chance to see the Gottlieb Garden in Bel Air, or if you ever get a chance to go to Theodore Payne Foundation in Sunland, uh, it's really worth it because mm. this is, it's gonna get more and more serious as the DWP says, hey, you, you, you know, we're wasting huge amounts of water from the Owens River Valley mm -hmm. to, to water lawns. Mm -hmm. It's not gonna work. Mm -hmm. You have to get rid of your lawn. Now, if you've got kids, you know, I mean, I'm doing a lot of landscaping friends. Oh, maybe we can leave a little patch, but, you can't have these enormous, I mean, they're taking water from the farmers and from our, our drinking and, you know, so more and more, you're going to see people taking out their lawns and saying, mm -hmm. what do I do? And just tell them, go to the Theodore Payne Foundation. All I the, wrote it down. I'm gonna... All the information's there. So how so I... on earth do you deal? We were talking before the show about aging and steps. How do you deal with this really steep? Do you have stairs in your house too? You, you come up this impossible, horrific driveway. <laughs> You've already come into the hills. Then you come up this horrific driveway and you're lucky if you make it up the driveway because it's got a hairpin turn and there's a few friends who won't come up. Then you have to come up a flight of stairs to get to the house. So when I had finally moved in, which was a very, very taxing and painful move, I, I was so physically exhausted. I was winded. I was desperate. I, I panicked and I thought, what have I done? You know, at my age, I, you know, I should have probably just bought a one story ranch house. That's what they tell you to do, right? They say, oh, at your age, you should have a one story ranch house. You don't have to, you know. So I went to my chiropractor and I said, you know, I think I've painted myself into a corner. And maybe it's a corner I needed to paint myself into. Because? Because I can't stay in this house if I can't get myself physically fit. Absolutely no way. I, I, I mean, I was crawling upstairs. 
So, oh my God, I said to her, you know, and I was overweight. This is not a no, no news. All you got to do is look at my website and you go, wow, what a magnificent, huge butt that person. Had. It's like I was overweight. And even though I was swimming every day, I still wasn't nailing it. And so I said to my chiropractor, should I go on Weight Watchers? And she said, yes, their new program is incredible. So I went, I I'm going to have to, much as I, I love to eat and I'm, you know, all... I said, if I don't deal with this, I might as well just turn around and sell this house because I will, I will not be able to stay here. So I put myself on Weight Watchers and I lost a, a bunch of weight. I'm still on it. And I, I started going to virtual yoga. I'd been in my virtual yoga class, but I upped the game. I started going like a lot of times a week. And she also told me get hiking poles. Because hiking poles, like, you know, your trail buddies, I've got a pair here. You know, I've got three pair. You want to walk down your steep hill. She said, walk down with hiking poles. Wow. It'll really help you. And walk back up with hiking poles. Because I have uh, Achilles t tendinosis. So I, ha I, I have to. So I got hiking poles. And I, because of Weight Watchers, a lot of the inflammation went away. And I have, are you doing like gluten-free, dairy-free, any of that, or you're eating everything? You're just, I'm in Weight Watchers. I'm garden variety, nice Jewish girl in Weight Watchers, the blue program. Okay. I'm green. I'm okay. Green. So, and it's been fantastic because it took, it, it took out a lot of the inflammation. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I can walk up my stairs now, you know, and, and, uh, I'm, I go to the local pool and I'm building a, a small pool myself up here. It's, it's going to be insane, but you know, I'm, I'm exercising. It's either that or buy that ranch house. You know, <laughs> I have two friends, a friend that lives in Topanga and a friend that lives in, in Los Feliz. And I won't go to their houses because it's so steep to drive that it scares the shit out of me. So it sounds like you have one of those houses I do. that's scary as shit. <laughs> I do. It's scary as shit. We've built some really cool, um, railroad ties stairways going up to it but it's still scary as shit and that's life you know and yeah. and i'm sad because a couple of my friends say i won't come up and so i'm talking and saying well maybe we should buy a golf cart we're right below right above me i mean i have this incredible view and it's really mm -hmm. spectacular and i've got a three-room studio complex and you know wendy has no complaints no complaints i am blessed and that's why i'm really trying to up my involvement again in music and give back but above me is a youtube family and they they have this enormous mansion i mean it's wow. the ace family and they they have this they they bought the whole mountaintop and they built this i mean it's got to be thirty thousand square feet above oh my god me. and they have a a, a golf cart <laughs> and they they come up and down the, the street on their golf cart so i'm thinking of getting one it would have to be pretty strong to come up my hill, but another research project for the I love house. it. I lo <laughs> All right, so this is a really good place to segue into a song before we start talking about you and your, where you come from. So I'm excited. <laughs> yeah. Pretty good play. a yellow moon coming up tonight shining through the trees crickets are jumping and the lightning bugs are floating on the breeze baby get ready across the field where the creek turns back by the old stump road Take you to a special place that nobody knows. Baby, get ready. Ooh, we, you and me, going fishing in the dark, lying on our backs and counting the stars where the cool grass grows. Down by the river in the full moon. And we'll be falling in love in the middle of the night Just moving slow Stop 
stay the whole night through Summer's coming, the days are getting long. I waited all winter for the time to be right, just to take you along. Baby, get ready, get ready. And it don't matter if we sit forever, and the fish don't bite, the fish don't bite. We'll jump in the river and we'll cool ourselves from the heat of fishing shirt it's a columbia it's an actual fishing shirt for your fishing in the dark <laughs> where, where did that song come from where, what inspired that that song is is a was and is a huge huge hit song with nitty gritty jerk band i know yes and with garth brooks and it i wrote it with the esteemed and brilliant songwriter who should be a guest with you jim photoglow if he hasn't Love already that. So Jimmy and I, we, we migrated to Nashville in 1984. I went down first and he came down. We had just met, a bunch of us came down to Nashville in the early 80s. And we were writing songs. We were learning the Nashville way, which is a whole other, you know, for me, it was like moving to a foreign country. I was how so? How, what do you mean? How so? Well, because it, in the community was very, very different. The way you wrote, the way you interacted, um, it was a very tiny community. Mm -hmm. You know, remember, I'm coming out of Los Angeles. I'm a right. pop musician. I show up in my in my purple leather jacket. You know, <laughs> and, and this is Nashville. Um, it's 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 Nashville in in the mid early '80s, and it's just coming out of its own the urban cowboy period. And at the time in Nashville, you could have a hit record and only sell twenty five thousand copies. Mm -hmm. There were only four or five platinum acts: Alabama, uh, the Oak Ridge Boys, um, Barbara Mandrell, mm -hmm. and Hank Jr. And that was it. Everybody else was really? not, not yeah it, Nashville was and so I like to joke that Nashville even took help from us Californians at that <laughs> so I came down there because I had a great publisher named Charlie Feldman at Screen Gems who had encouraged me to come down and I had played Nashville in the 70s with Ronstadt and with mm -hmm. myself and, and it scared the hell out of me because I knew by reputation that Nashville songwriters were very tough and that it was like a college campus that it was it was all contained on three streets mm -hmm. 16th 17th and 18th avenue mm -hmm. music square uh, uh north and south you know it was a very very small everybody knew everybody mm -hmm. a lot of the old legends were still alive and around and they didn't cotton to newcomers especially californians but mm -hmm. i had and i had been very fortunate because uh, my reputation had preceded me. I had by that point put out the the uh, five Warner Brothers records, and I had put out the one record on Sony, Which Way to Main Street, and I had played there. And I had had the critical acclaim that, thank you, God, has has managed to ha me keep me in my phony baloney career for fifty years. You know. <laughs> 
<laughs> and uh, Tony Baloney. So, so I got down there, and people, and I also happened with Josh Leo at that point by no through no fault of my own to have a hit record with Crystal Gale. And I didn't even know what's country music. So I'm down in Nashville and, and I met all these people and they would come up to me and say, you know, I've always loved your work. I, I you know, you're, you're, I saw you here or I have this record. Wow. This was so different than California in 1983 where writers were, you know, if you're writing with me, I'm not going to introduce you to my friends. Oh. It was really, you know, it was a tough time because... The lyrical music time, the country folk, you know, the Ronstadt era was over. Mm -hmm. And we had this incredible punk and new wave thing going on here in L.A. Mm -hmm. But if you were from the 70s, you were like, you might as well go out with last night's trash. Mm -hmm. And Charlie Feldman saw me here in L.A. and he said, why don't you come down to Nashville and, and let's see how it goes. So I came down and I wrote with some people and they were so generous. I mean, they were so cool. It was like, wait a minute, what you, you know, and they would introduce me to someone else. Mac McAnally would introduce me, you know, this is my friend, Donnie Lowry. We wrote for Alabama. You know, you two would write great together. It's like, wow. wait, what, what did you say? I mean, are you, and so that was how it, it worked. So Jim Photoglo came down to Nashville early on in 84 and stayed with me and he loved it. And he was coming off a pop career. You may remember, he's a wonderful soul singer from Englewood. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, so he and I were learning the ropes together as, as songwriters. So one day, Jim comes into the house. I had a ho an apartment. I mean, I was a mini, you know, Dorothy Parker or Gertrude Stein. People would come into my little apartment on 10th Avenue, on 18th Avenue. And he came in and I said, I got this lick. Now, remember, I cut my teeth at the Ash Grove with Taj Mahal. So I, I, I'm steeped in, you know, I'm a folk musician. So Jim comes in and he's going to kill me when he sees this, but I've told <laughs> the story forever. I'm getting him back because there are times when he does a gig and he goes, is Wendy Waldman in the room? <laughs> and there'll be no, nobody will say anything. And he'll go, here's a song I wrote myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Jim comes in and he goes, I found this great lick. And he goes, Now, I've already, I'm a, at this point, I'm 30 or 32, and I've been listening to Skip James and Robert Johnson since I'm 15. And I've only, I've studied from Taj, and I've, you know, know Maria Muldor and all these funky folk and blues musicians. And he's playing me this lick, because he's a pop musician. And he's discovered blues lick 1A. <laughs> and I, I, I said, well, that, that's just really fantastic. <laughs> that's, that's great. And he said, okay. Kind of like, well, I did the heavy lifting. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> so I said, well, actually, he said, do you have any ideas? And I said, well, I got this. The strangest thing came into my head. I don't know what to... I'm embarrassed to tell you. I can't. It's so stupid. I don't even know. But it, and he finally goes, Waldman, out with it. And I went, well, I don't know what it means, but I just ha had this phrase, fishing in the dark. And Jim, who is even to this day, astonishingly, astonishingly gorgeous to look at. <laughs> fishing in the dark. I don't know what it means, but I like it. <laughs> So we wrote Fishing in the Dark. Our demo was with Vince Gill singing. Wow. On my little Fostex 8 track that I had wow. gotten. And um, first, uh, Ed Bruce cut it, and then I was producing the Ozark Mountain Daredevils. And they cut it, and their version caught Josh Leo's attention. And Josh was part of our family. And, and uh, Josh came to me and he said, I'm going to. I'll never forget this. He said, I'm going to screw you, but I'm going to make you a lot of money. And I said, what are you going to do? He said, uh, the dirt band is going to cut your version of fishing in the dark, the daredevils version. And I, I was like, please don't the daredevils have got a record deal based on this. Please don't, please oh. don't. And he's, you know, he said, you know what? I, I, I can't. 
it's already been recorded. You don't have, you can't stop me. And, and he said, and, and I have to, and we're going to do it. And they did, you know, and, and I mean, this is, you know, and he was right. I mean, we, the dares did not get their deal. Um, but Fishing in the Dark became, it's like the, one of the biggest songs in country music history written by, you know, a Jew and a Greek from Los Angeles, <laughs> California. And, you know, but in our defense, when we went to Nashville, we learned the ways. Mm. We learned, you know, that you, you, you studied from the masters. You didn't just go in and tell them how to make records. You didn't tell them how to write songs. I learned early on when I started producing records that the whole town was run by the secretaries and they were all in white stockings in those days and dresses. They were, you know, Nashville is upper South. It's, it's wealthy. It's very genteel. Yes. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, the music business in those days was not the primary business. It was looked at as the dirty stepchild, the real businesses of, of, of the community. Nashville's big money was religious publishing and healthcare. Wow. All wow. the big healthcare companies are centered there. So, for example, I lived, I managed to buy a house in Bel Mead, which was like buying a house in Bel Air. A tiny house on the edge of Bel Mead. No musicians lived there. I, because Bel Mead was its own city with its own police, I was stopped in front of my house one time and asked if I was a gypsy. Oh my. Yeah, because their gypsies came up from Dixon, Tennessee and would would you know scam all the rich people minnie pearl the great you know yes uh, artist lady. yeah what who was a wonderful woman and, and and aside from her act she was a very genteel person she was one of the few musicians from that generation that was kind of welcomed into bel mead hmm. you know she belonged to the country club was restricted wow. so you know in the old days the bel mead country club no Jews, no blacks. So wow. that, you know, so this was the Nashville. It was just on its tail end. I came into that Nashville in 1983 as a resident and a bunch of my friends came down and then Rodney and Roseanne came down in 84 and a bunch of people came and, and what I've tried to explain sociologically is that at the community at the time, there were maybe a hundred, 200 serious players in country music it was all based in nashville because the country music association had rewritten history and said okay this is where it comes from you know forget bakersfield forget the louisiana hayride forget the fact that you know uh, uh what's his name bob wills and those guys cut in new york in the 30s nashville is country music and um there were, so the population of shakers and movers when I got there was very small. They all knew each other and it was a real tight group. And we Californians and New Yorkers and Chicagoans came in and they needed our help. They needed us to be writing and collaborating with them. And we did, we got in and we started working. The great Tony Brown sponsored a lot of us. Tony Brown was a fan of mine and Mac McAnally had said, yeah, you should work with Waldman. And so Tony accessed all of my people that way. And, and we learned, mm -hmm. you know, for example, and, and they still do it 10, two and six, I got a 10 o'clock writing session and then I got a two o'clock and I got a six. And then, uh, tomorrow we've got a 10 and a two demo session. And it was all right there in the studio. So you'd walk across the alley with your guitar. Mm -hmm. At, you know, well, I got a two o'clock and you'd walk in, there'd be three songwriters and a band and somebody was producing the session and it's like, okay, what are we doing? Well, we got two Wendy Waldman songs and we've got a Don Schlitz tune, a Craig Bickhart tune. And a, I think someone else is coming in at the end and we would cut our tunes. And then you went, oh man, I've got a six o'clock. There's a guy who came in from Alabama. I got to meet him over at the publishing cubicle because we're going to write. And you'd sit down with someone you never had met before. And, wow. the, and you'd go, and they'd, they'd say, well, yeah, hey, I've always loved your work. So what you got? And, you know, coming from California, and this was the old way that songs were written in Nashville. These, you know, they, they took no prisoners. And you learned, okay. Uh, I'm sitting here with this person. He, he can clearly see I'm from the other tribe and 
he can guess my politics, but he likes my reputation. He's heard about me and he's, he's saying, okay, what you got? And you pick up your guitar and you go, how about this? And in some cases, guys have notebooks full of titles. In some cases, guys have, well, here's a start I had. In my case, I never did. I just went, I don't know, man. Let's see what happens. And I just, In the moment, and yeah. you would just always be able to pull it out. Wow. I would just grab my guitar and go, well, what if we... Because I hated the idea of, you know... And they would read you these titles, you know, and, you you, you know, I'd go, oh, God. You know, that's like... I, I don't know, just really, some of them were really corny. I always say, you know, they all sounded like if I'd shot you when I wanted to, I'd be out by now. You know, I mean, those, <laughs> the, but, and, and titles that we, you know, like if I, that there was a famous song, if, if I, if I said you were beautiful, would you hold it against me or something? You know, I mean, it's like, okay, I get it. There's a lot of that stuff. Now it's all replaced by bro country. But the thing that's important is that in the mid 80s, when our family, the, the extended family of of immigrants came into Nashville and we re really began to have a voice, we mm -hmm. began to produce records and to I want to talk about that. How like that started. This this had a huge impact and Nashville went through in the mid to late 80s what mm -hmm. what was what was called the class of 89, which was Alan Jackson. Garth mm -hmm. Brooks, Susie Boggess, whom I was producing. Mm -hmm. Of course, Newgrass Revival was, was finally came to its place. Um, Hal Ketchum, Rodney and Roseanne. These artists, Kathy Matea, were all influenced by our folk influences. Mm -hmm. And we, we had a huge impact, a very, it was a fantastic, if you look at the, the songs of Nashville in the mid eighties to, to 90, there's some incredible work. And a lot of it was because the, we, we were allowed to participate, you know, and we were invited to participate and we took our place. Um, I left in 91. Why? Personal reasons. My husband was leaving and I had a year old baby and I wanted to go back to LA to save the marriage. And also uh, hidden in this, which I didn't know at the time, was, and I am always ever thankful to Brad Parker, my ex-husband for this, it saved my life. I needed to, to get out of there. I needed to come back to myself as an artist, even though I lost a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, what I gained was my life because mm -hmm. I had, I was beginning to produce records. I was being offered bigger and bigger gigs and I was not seeing myself as the artist I am anymore i had kind of lost my california roots and and i know i would have been by now rich alcoholic and if if not dead living down there so brad left and i remember going to our family doctor you know after brad left and i was i got abe and i'm producing and i went to our doctor and i said you know that he's gone back to la uh what do you think i should do and doc the doc said you know i think you should go and I said, really? But look, I, I just, look at my career here. I mean, I'm going to be huge. You know, I'm the first chick producer. And it's kind of bullshit, you know. And he said, you know, Nashville's a commercial town. Uh, at its root, that's what this is. And he said, and you're an artist. Wow. You're an artist from, from California. And he said, you need to go back to your own kind. You need to go back. Because this is, you know... It's been a nice stopover for you, but it ain't home. And he was right. And it took me 15 years to get my feet back in Los Angeles. It was really, really tough coming in, you know, but I am so grateful. I am a Californian. I am a Westerner. And I am really grateful that I was pulled out of there against my will because I had to you know, I lost everything. I lost a huge amount of money. I lost, I was afraid of flying, so I didn't commute. I had to rebuild everything. I didn't know anybody. I came back in and it was like 1991. I'd been gone since the early 80s. Like, what's going on? What's everybody doing? What kind of music is this? And I was saved, you know, the Committee on High put me back in touch with my old band, which was, of course, Kenny Edwards, Carla Bonoff, and Andrew Gold. And we, Brindle. Brindle reunited and Brindle made 
records. And had I not come back to Nashville, it never would have happened. Mm -hmm. And we got to make two and a half records before those guys passed on. So I, I'm, you know, so I am. So Wendy, when you came back, you were talking at the beginning about LA, people not introducing each other and everybody <laughs> kind of, did, did that scene change when you yes. came back? Ah, okay. Because I had, I had been in the Bluebird the night that of the first in the round, which was Craig Bickhart, Tom Schuyler, Don, um, wait a minute, uh, 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 four guys. I'm sorry. I, I just, I'm, I'm blanking. Don Schlitz mm -hmm. and um, one other person who will come to me in a minute. So those four guys were doing these, they, they started playing together. And one day they said, um, we need to move all the chairs and just sit in the middle. And we were there at the Bluebird. I mean, we were all hanging in slink, 1984. Mm -hmm. um, and these guys, they were, they were master songwriters and they were hysterical. And I saw the birth of In the Round and I did millions of In the Rounds. Nashville was so supportive of songwriters and, um, and, and really, you know, you, the, from, from the Bluebird In the Round, then there became In the Rounds everywhere. Writers' nights started happening. So right. when we got back to L.A., I saw that there was that nascent, there was maybe there were a couple of things going on. There was something happening at Molly Malone's, you know, it was kind of underground. And then rest in peace, Billy Block got in touch with Brad and me. And he said, I'm doing, I'm going to do a writer's night at Highland Grounds. Uh, Billy Blocks. And actually Brad came up with the terminology, the term Western Beat. That is a Brad Parker one. And if you know Brad and you know he's a fan of the Beat Poets, it, it, it could only be a Brad Parker, even though he did not get credit for coining that phrase. He said, well, let's call it Western Beat. So I religiously showed up at Western Beat for years, every month. Mm -hmm. And in fact, what, you know, because I, I mean, by now I'm, a, I'm an old relic from the 70s who's, you know, come out of Nashville and I'm, you know, in my cowboy boots and my whatever. And the LA Weekly did, did a review of Western Beat and it said, you can go and see, you know, the likes of Wendy Waldman at Western Beat. You know, we would show up. I mean, I don't know if you ever saw it at Highland Grounds, but it was incredible. I was in New York that time. It, it was really fantastic. And, and it went on and of course it grew. And then the other writer's night started to spawn. And I said to myself, I'm, I'm here. I'm not going back to Nashville. Um, I can see that the future is in me supporting my community and getting my little ass out there and, and playing as much as I can, even though I know you'll find this hard to believe I'm a hermit and I'd rather not, you know, but I, it's like, I got out there for years and Brindle got out there and, and I played with all kinds of, I met Lowen and Navarro and they were playing. And so, in the early 90s, Los Angeles began to stand up on its hind feet again. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there were, there were, and, and rebuild itself. Can and we, you play us something from the time? I don't know what you have planned. I, play anything. I, I, we would play Fishing in the Dark. I, everything I play, we would play. I mean, uh, I, I'm going to play one thing that I didn't play, but by then, um, in 92, I had Save the Best for Last with Vanessa Williams, with Phil Galston and John Lind, and I was playing an acoustic version of that. Yeah, I love your version of that. There is nothing like hearing a songwriter play their own song. I'm sorry. You know, Vanessa Williams does a beautiful job, but I prefer your version. It's cool. Thanks. Um, I, I might I might fire that very song up tonight. I fire uh, it up, fire it up. I would but, love that. But anyhow, you know, we, we were doing, a, a, we were just out there playing and it led to a lot of th magical things. And, mm -hmm. and I take great pride in, in being a, a California musician. I really do. I, 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 I cut my teeth with Linda Ronstadt and J.D. Souther before the Eagles. Brindle was formed before the Eagles. We hung out with Long Branch Penny Whistle, which was Glenn Fry and, and Souther. And, 
you know, I was at the Ash Grove from the time I was 14 years old. Turns out alongside Dave Alvin, we were the two underage kids who would go into the Ash Grove every Friday night and stand in the back because we weren't supposed to be there. And we <laughs> saw, we saw it all. We saw Lightning Hopkins. We saw the Chambers Brothers. And it's so funny, you know, Bill Munro, the Clarence and Roland White, you know, you name it. And, and now I, I remember, you know, because in those days, guys would come through and play for a week. You'd play mm -hmm. Tuesday through Sunday. Mm -hmm. And you'd go, oh, man, it's just Lightning Hopkins again, you know. I, like, <laughs> and I just go, oh, I would kill. I would kill to have one more night sitting in the Ash Grove to see Lightning Hopkins or the night I first saw Taj Mahal solo when I was 15, sitting back on a chair, the world's most gorgeous human being playing a national and singing Karina. I went, I've... I've died and gone to heaven. Okay, and Wendy, how did this start? I know your father was a composer. Your father was a composer. The Perry Mason theme, oh my God, which I watched. And not, so it was, when did music start? So music was always in your home. I grew up with classical music. My father wrote not only per the Perry Mason theme, but the, the first early seasons of T Twilight Zone and Star Trek. <sighs> and Rocky and Bullwinkle and oh my God. thousands of gun smokes. And he was uh, under contract to CBS mm -hmm. and he was no, he was known his circle, his circle of friends, you mm -hmm. know, mine might've been Ronstadt and Kenny Edwards and you know, whatever his was Bernard Herman and Elmer Bernstein and, oh, and you know, Hank Mancini and because they all came up together. Mm -hmm. Some of them were immigrants. They were r running from. Where, where was your father from? My father was from New York and, and my mother was from New Haven and they met at Oberlin in the conservatory and they were great musicians. And he came out West with the radio show called This Is Your FBI. They had it first, first when he graduated, he worked in radio in New York. And then the producer of that show, who was a wonderful producer and writer named Jerry Devine said, there's this thing out in LA that they're doing now, uh, it's called television. <laughs> and uh, and we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna go and make the transition. We're gonna turn it into a TV show. And it's so funny because, so they went, you know, the whole, most, most of them picked up and went. Now, fast forward, I work with a great engineer, record producer, and also doctor of Chinese medicine named Rob Hoffman. Mm -hmm. Rob Hoffman cut his teeth with as an under as the second for Bruce Swedeen at I think the Hit Factory in New York City, uh -huh. working with Michael Jackson and Quincy Jones, and Rob says, "Well, one day, you know," and he and Rob was still in that stage where you're crawling around and plugging in mics for Bruce Swedeen and Michael Jackson, you know, and he said, "One day I came into the studio and they said, we're all going to Los Angeles. We're moving to California." And it was so funny because I said, you know, that's not the first time I've heard about a whole crew of people. And in, in the case of my father, it was more than just one crew. It was, hmm. you know, hundreds of people came to L.A. and they started the television business. But, mm -hmm. you know, when I went to Nashville, it was that same thing. It was a migration. Mm -hmm. And I remember, I'm digressing a little bit, but the talk of the, the discussion of migrating for, mute, for work, when I was going to go down to Nashville, I went to my dad and said, do you think I should? And he said, we did. We picked up and we left New York. He said, you got to go where the work is. Wow. Mm -hmm. So he, he came out here and he wound up under contract with CBS and he became probably one of the most influential television composers of all time. And his buddies became, you know, were famous film composers. Mm -hmm. um, and he, he lived out here. There was a brief period of time where we lived in Mexico city in the late fifties because he had an, he, he was a, an adventurous guy and he had an opportunity to help establish some music libraries down there. So we, we, Jillian and I grew up, we were seven and 11 living in Mexico city for a couple of years. Do you speak we, Spanish? Yes. And my sister lives in Mexico now. I mean, so it was, you know, we, we've had, so we grew up with chamber music being played in the house by all these great studio players, but also we would, we went to summer camp and we would hear the Weavers and Pete Seeger. And then I became interested in Dylan when I was 
14. Okay, now you, what's the first thing that you play? Do you play guitar first, piano? What's the first I took, thing? I took piano as a little sure. girl. You yeah, had yeah. to, you're a little Jewish girl. And I took ballet <laughs> and I, I hated piano and I, 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 didn't, I didn't want to practice. But by the time I was 13 or 14, I was full on rebel. I mean, I was smoking weed and I was out of control. And I, I, and my father had he was still a, he was a member of Naris, and you would get this booklet. It was like this this shape booklet, and it would come every month, and you could check off the records you wanted, and they were three bucks a piece if you were a Naris member. So Dad would go through, and oh, here's Music Masters doing a a version of the that wonderful piece that was written in the you know 1400s, and they're doing it. With, you know, it's like your brain did, and then he'd toss me the book and say, "Is there anything you want here?" And I was like, "Well, I." I want Thelonious Monk solo. What is that? I want Robert Johnson, King of the Delta Blues. I I'll guess I'll get that. And I want, look at all these Smithsonian records. I remember them because we used to listen to the, the little Smithsonian records as kids, the little ones for children, mm -hmm. Woody Guthrie and Cisco Houston and singing, mm -hmm. you know, go to sleep, little baby. And the Weavers would do these children's records. And so I became, got into listening to that and I also I was the first time I heard Bob Dylan I hated him the third time I heard him I was like I'm in yeah and I was 14 and I started writing songs and um I started getting involved in in you know I got my mother to drop me off at the Ashgrove every Friday night before I had a license and I was in a very progressive school. And at this progressive school, by this time I'm 15, 15 years old, mm -hmm. I'm playing the blues. I'm playing the blues, man. You know, I, I figured that out. So I'm like a 15 year old, braces, uh, you know, cigarette. And this guy comes to teach at our school, whose name is Ken Waldman, and who is with us yet. And he comes and he's just come back from Harvard where he got his master's in education. But originally he's an Arizona boy and he grew up with the Ronstadts. Mm -hmm. So he was a folk fan and he was a fan of Linda's and there were no stone ponies yet or anything. And he'd gone to Harvard, which is in Cambridge, and he started going to, to Club 47, mm -hmm. which is now Passim's. And he met the Queskin Jug Band, Maria Muldor, Jeff Muldor, Jim Queskin, Fritz Richmond, you know, uh, um, and Jim Queskin, of course. Now he comes to teach, because all life is, is Rhodes. He comes to teach at our school at Oakwood. We are the first graduating, high school graduating class of Oakwood. There's 30 of us and we're stoned at, out of our minds. And we're also brilliant. We have amazing teachers. We're reading French literature and, you know, and here's Ken Waldman teaching history. And he also really loves music. And he gets wind of the fact that my friends and I, Andrew Gold or Andy Gold, whose father was my father's friend, Ernest Gold, who wrote the theme from Exodus, and Peter Bernstein, whose dad was Elmer, who was also my dad's friend, the three of us were playing music. We were like playing music and Ken Waldman came in and he said, oh, you guys are interesting. I'm going to kind of hang out and encourage you. So we formed a jug band called Diamond Roscoe's Jubilee Quintet, which Dr. Demento has played. <laughs> and Ken introduced us to the Queskin Jug Band and he introduced us. In my senior year, he brought some friends of his over from Arizona, the Stone Ponies, which was Linda and Bobby Kimmel and Kenny had joined from out here. And they came to our school and they played and all I could see was Kenny Edwards. <laughs> I saw the way this guy played and I saw the way he sang and I went, I I'm going to be in a band with that guy. I I'm going to be in a band with him. And I was, you know, when I graduated, I got into every school that every Jewish girl is supposed to go to. And, <laughs> and I dropped out to the horror of my father. Uh, I, I t turned down Sarah Lawrence and then I dropped out of UC Berkeley within six weeks because the first night I was in Berkeley, Taj was playing down the road. 
and I had this stack. I mean, Berkeley's tough, you know, the stack of books. Now I could do it. I've been in school, I could do it. But in those days, it was like, dude, Taj is down the road. How could I, how could Taj be here and me not go? I'd already had tech, taken lessons from him and was friends with him. So I went down the road and played with Taj and met a bunch of Berkeley heads and never looked back. And I came back to Los Angeles with my tail between my legs. And I said, I'm going to be a musician. And my dad said, you're going to have to prove that to me. Was your father college educated? Oh, God, yes. Oh, yes. Okay. He was a, one of the great classical scholars, which is why he and Bernard Herrmann were dear friends, because my father knew his shit. He was a deep scholar. If you mm -hmm. ask anybody about, I mean, Jim schweda has got a funny story about Fred Steiner over at KUSC, you know, that when my dad passed, Schweda talked about him and he said, so one night I'm on, you know, schweda has been doing, you know, the music on, on KUSC at seven o'clock for a thousand years. And he's very knowledgeable. And he says, so one night I'm talking about a very obscure German composer. And I'm sure nobody knows about this guy. And I'm talking about him. You know, Schweda can be a little full of himself sometimes, <laughs> although I'm a huge fan, a huge fan. And he says, so I, I misspoke. But who cares? Nobody knows who this guy is. He says, the phone rings. And it's Fred Steiner out in the valley. And he said, he, of course, he knew who Fred Steiner was. And Fred said, actually, that, that's not correct. And he corrected me and Jim Schweda said, from then on, every night I thought, be careful because Fred Steiner's out there listening. <laughs> wow. So I did prove myself. I wound up, you know, I started going out and playing. I played the troubadour hoots. I, I always like to tell, you know, people we would get out of school mm -hmm. and be at the troubadour on Monday at three o'clock. Oh, this is the hoot nanny. Is this the right. hoot nanny? Mm -hmm. And I was always number three in line and Jackson was always number one. And I couldn't, and I finally said, well, he must live closer. <laughs> I told that story at, at Best of the West when I got the award, and he, he just howled. I said, I, I, you know, and I was 16, and I got my first encore, and I drove that night over to Ken Waldman's house and pounded on his door in my little short dress with my braids, and I said, I got an encore. I don't know what the hell I was singing. I was probably singing the blues, but I got bored with the blues because it was only three chords, and I had grown up listening to in somewhere in my mind, you know, I'd been collecting jazz and I'd been, you know, I, and I went, maybe there's something in this songwriting. Maybe I want to write something. So I became a songwriter. Do you remember your, which, the first, you have to remember the first thing you wrote. You don't. I wow. have cassettes back to 1968. So it'd be pretty wow. close. But I remember my first cut, my first cut was Living Like There's No Tomorrow with Bobby Kimmel and the Floating House Band. So, you know, and that was in, I want to say, that would have been in 69. So, I mean, I'm really old, you guys. Hey, right behind you. <laughs> how many guitar, Wendy, how many guitars are essential Wendy Waldman? Like, how many do you keep close? Well, I've been off my guitars for a long time because I've been a Pro Tools guy and I've been I've been working in Pro Tools and writing in Pro Tools and writing. And I, I studied, I was in school. I was at Valley College for several years. I studied piano. And all of a sudden, I, I've, I'm whipping out all the guitars. So right now, today, there's a, a bunch of acoustics, but I also have a, a couple of serious vintage electrics. And... Um, what do you play electric? I, pl I have a I have two Stratocasters, mm -hmm. and I have a, a, a ES-175 copy, because in 1975, on that record, when we were touring, I had an, an, an ES-175, a Gibson. It was incredible. And like an idiot. And here it goes, like, okay, all you guys out there, let's think about the great instruments we sold or traded for. <laughs> Right. I traded a Paul Stanley that he gave me, Gold Top Les Paul, shoot me now, for some keyboard. I traded all my Oberheim gear. I mean, Tom Oberheim sponsored me and gave me all this gear. How stupid are we when we're kids? And I can, I know some of my friends said they were going to, I can hear it. Yeah. I, oh, ow, ow. So I traded the, the Oberheim stuff for like a guy to build a fence for me, you know? Oh, God. Yeah. So, but I, I, I found this uh, Epiphone copy of the 175, which is a big, 
It's, it's back there. It's, it's a fat arch, bo- arch top, and it's wonderful. And um, I still manage to have, I retain my, I've got a 37 Martin OM28 that I got from Norm's Rare Guitars, and I've got a 57 Strat mm-hmm. that I also got, both of them for a 1000 bucks at Norm's Rare Guitars. And I became a tailor um, teacher. My f- friend Jeff Hyman mm-hmm. managed the great Artie Traum, rest in peace, whose last record I produced. And Artie was a tailor artist. Back mm-hmm. in the days when Taylor would have flat pickers and, you know, all these great player Dan Crary and, you know, Beppe Gambetta and Artie Trump going around and doing workshops at the stores. So they brought me on as a songwriter teacher and I became a tailor person. Um, And it turns out the next generation has just become tailor because my son, Abraham Parker, who's a stunning musician, is playing with the great John Cowan from Newgrass Revival and from, who's now playing in the Doobie Brothers, and Andrea Zahns, and Andrea, who plays with James Taylor. She's a fiddler. I heard the three of you do a, a song. Yes. John and, yeah. Mm-hmm. So they, they had a, they've made a band called the Herculeons, and I've, I've produced John off and off, off and on since Newgrass. And th- I was really blessed to be asked to produce this new record. But first, they sent me a brilliant Susan Werner song and just said, what, what, what should we do with this? I said, I know what to do. I'm going to cut you guys a track out here. And I cut this track with Abe. Abe and I cut this thing. And we sent it to them, and they flipped out. Mm-hmm. And we wound up through a lot of steps with me producing the Herculeons, and Abe went down to Nashville with me and cut the album and then was subsequently absorbed into the band. So my son... This very evening is flying that he's in Nashville rehearsing and he and the Herculeons are going to play Merle Fest, which is the East Coast equivalent of the Telluride Bluegrass Festival. Now ask me if the refugees or Wendy Waldman ever played (laughs) Merle Fest. Not in my recollection. I was told as the record producer, you can come to Merle Fest and if you're there, you might as well sing. It's like... That's not what I was thinking. But Abe was using my guitars and and I and he needed his own. So I called our rep at Taylor and I said, Give me a price. What what Abe Abe's playing with one of the great acoustic bands, new bands in the country. What what can he do? And Tim said, I'm sending you a guitar. Hmm. I said, All right, you know, he said, see if he likes it. If not, you know, he'll 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 come down and, you know, so Abe said, man, it's so cool that you're a Taylor artist and you could do that. And I said, I think you're missing the point. They, they want new, young, brilliant players. Mm-hmm. So Abe is, it's pretty clear, he's now Fantastic. a Taylor artist. So. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, you know, I have two Steinway pianos. Mm-hmm. That's what's really... Mm-hmm. I. When I hosted Folk Scene, I, when I say hosted, I mean I gave them a home in 2001 when it was one of the last of the great live radio performance shows. Um, they lost their home at KPFK, and I said, I have a studio in Encino. Come on, you know. And they did. And then I get a phone call from Roz Larman. It was Roz and Howard Larman, who are, of course, legends in the folk music world. And Roz calls me and leaves me a message. Remember, answering machine? Check your machine. You're going to plot. <laughs> so I check my machine, and here's this voice. Uh, hi, this is George Winston. Um, I've always been a fan of yours. And um, I understand that you're giving a home to folk scene, and I want to know if there's anything I can do to help you. Be, because you were on in April of 74, and I went on in May of 76. This guy is encyclopedic. So I called him, and I said, well, hi. You know, I'm thinking to myself, and he says, I, I loved meeting you, and you were very, very supportive and generous of me in those days. And I went, I knew I shouldn't have smoked all that weed. <laughs> Did I mean well- I I know George Winston. So then I thought about it. I thought, oh, I know where. And I remember it. And yes, I was making my first record. And he was a 
delivery guy and had made a little record at Tacoma. And he came into Clover Recorders to deliver something. And he walked in and he sat down and he was playing the piano. And this is, this is our exchange. I walked in and sat down next to him on the piano bench and went, well, man, you're the one who should be making records. That was it. <laughs> he was playing Thanksgiving or something. You know, fast forward, it was actually Jeff Hyman who wound up signing George Winston to uh, Wyndham Hill not long after. And so George, I said to George, yes, I do. Now I remember, I said, I don't have an acoustic piano. And if Jackson Brown or Tom Waits or some, or uh, Jimmy Webb come back to do a folk scene, it'd be nice to have a real piano. So can you help me get a Yamaha studio upright? And he says, yes, I, I can get you a good deal on that. And I said, I can only rent it. I can't buy it. So a day later, he says, he calls me and he says, do you have room for a nine foot piano in your house? And at the time, my house in Encino had a 40 foot living room. And I said, yeah, man, I, I do. And if I didn't, I'd be breaking through a wall. What, what have you got? <laughs> and he said, well, one of my Steinways is an orphan. And it's at a, at a girlfriend's house and no one's playing it. And it's a nine footer. It's a D. And he said, do you want it? And I was like, wait, I've gone from not having an acoustic piano for 15 years to, do you want this nine foot Steinway D? Jesus. Two weeks later, he shows up at my doorstep with the moving company and the piano. And we've been wow. fast friends ever since. And then when my father passed, I inherited his, his smaller Steinway. So. And you have them in that house up that hill? Yeah. Oh my God. I built a three room studio complex. And you know, the great Eliza Gilkinson right now is building a studio in her new house in Taos. And I wrote to her and I said, the, the new occupation of 70 year old women, build a studio. <laughs> so. Well, speaking of which, Wendy, how did, how did you become a producer? How did that happen? That's not something that women were doing. You know, when I was making those early Warner Brothers records with Chuck Plotkin producing the first two and then the great Nick Vinay and then Peter Bernstein and Mike Flicker, I always was arranging. Chuck had pushed me to write string parts on Love Has Got Me on the first album. And he said, well, you, it's in your blood. And I went, oh, that's in my blood. You know, the only thing in my blood in those days was hashish, you know. I, <laughs> but he said, no, you have to write strings. So, and Chuck brilliantly put together an incredible section for the first album. So I wrote these string parts. And then my father by now had come he'd become a believer. And he wrote a bunch of string charts. Ah. But I was an arranger. I was, you know, I'd been a vocal, we were doing backgrounds. I mean, the Brindle singers, we were singing on everybody's records. And we were all really fast ear singers. And, and in Nashville, when I got down there, the fact that I could sit with Mac McAnally and in three seconds say, okay, you got the third, I got the fifth, who's going to take the, the, the melody? Okay, now let's invert. I mean, we were really fast. We were monsters, you know, we really knew our stuff because we had great ears. So I met up with a manager named Mike Robertson, who mm -hmm. sponsored me in his studio. And, and Mike one day said, you need to make a record. And I said, oh, okay, I will. And, and, and I said, my dear friend, Harry Stinson, has, has emigrated down to, back to Nashville. He was the only California musician who actually was a Nashvillian. I said, I'll produce that record. You know, let's, let's, let me do it with Harry. Because I've gone back, I go back with Harry. We cut my last, you know, Sony record together. So Harry comes in and we start making Letters Home. And three songs in, I get a phone call from Tony Brown, who by now knows me. This is like 1986, maybe? Mm -hmm. 85. He knows me, he loves me. I've worked for him. I'm one of the elite guys in town and I'm making this record. And Tony calls me and he says, uh, Tell me about that Harry Stinson. Hmm. And if you've ever talked to Tony, he talks, like, tell me about the Harry Stinson. He good drummer? I said, oh, you know, here I am. You know, miss, like, just his tongue, just sucking my thumb, such a baby. I go, oh, he's fucking great, man. And, and, and I'll tell you something else. He's an amazing singer. The next thing I know, Harry Stinson is gone and he's in Steve Earle's band. <laughs> and I'm, I talked to Mike and Mike said, Produce it yourself. Finish it yourself. You can do this. So I produced Letters Home, which came out on Cyprus, and I'm very proud of that record. And then 
I get a phone call from Pam Mark Hall on Reunion, a Christian label, and she comes to me and says, I really love your work. Will you produce my record? And I go, you're, you're a Christian artist. Yeah, but I really love your work. Will you produce my record? So I had to go into Reunion Records and sit down with them. You know, they were managing Amy Grant, you know, the huge mm -hmm. Christian label. And I had heard a lot about Christian labels at that time. And I said, you guys know I'm from the old tribe, right? And they said, we know who you are. And they, I'm, I signed a contract that they that paid me four thousand dollars to produce this record. But if I went over budget, it came out of my pocket. Ouch! So I did the, this Pam Mark Hall record, and of course I went over budget. So I wound up walking away with two grand, you know. But it was a great experience. And the mm -hmm. next thing that happened was I got a phone call from the Forrester sisters, who were from Georgia, very famous, very hard country. We're talking hard country, you know, from, from uh, you know, what that whatever that lookout mountain, Georgia. <laughs> and they said, we, we want to cut your song, Letters Home, we'd, and we'd like you to produce it. And I was like, it's a rock record. It, it's a five-minute song. It was on the Letters Home album. Mm -hmm. We want to do Letters Home. And I said, it's, it's, it's. It's got, you know, it's just lyrics and, and it's got a lot of na-na's in it. It's got the na-na-na-na. And they said, we know, and w that's why we want you to do it, because we think you can, you can capture it for us. We've tried with some of the good old boys. So I, I cut it. It's wall to wall. You needle drop, the song starts, it goes all the way through, no solos, no nothing. At the end, it, it stops. It came in at about three, almost four minutes. We put 315 on the label and we had a hit. <laughs> and that started, you know, then I did a, I did a, that record. That's hysterical that you just put an arbitrary number on the label. <laughs> if you told them that it was, you know, the truth. I mean, you know, I was learning the ropes. Then I was invited to produce the best of Forrester sisters, but add some new material. And of course, Jim Ed Norman and one of the other big producers were were also cutting tracks for this, but it was my job to assemble the whole thing and cut tracks on the lesser singers in the band, <laughs> to say so. You know, I cut my teeth in Nashville. I produced Susie Boggess's uh, Somewhere Between album, which got us the Academy of Country Music Award. Um, I produced Jonathan Edwards, my dear friend. Mike Robertson and I did a lot of work together and I wound up producing for Capitol and producing for MCA, producing for Warner Brothers. And, uh, and, the swan and I did my own, and this all came because I produced Letters Home myself. Because Harry went to join Steve Earle's band because Tony Brown stole him from me. So, you know, I found that I loved being in the studio. Mm -hmm. um, the only reason I had a career in, in Nashville was because the studio musicians there liked me very much. They liked the way I worked. Um, I would, they would come, and these were monster players. I mean, these are, I cut my teeth with guys who are now legends, but in those days they were cutting demos. And, you know, I mean, I, I, Willie Weeks says I'm the first person who gave him work in Nashville. You know, he was a, he was a great bass player of color and he had just come out down to nashville out of the doobie brothers and and it was mac mcanally who said i think you're going to really love working with willie weeks and you know i worked with james stroud who wound up running nashville and i worked with of course eddie bayers and and brent rowan who to this day is a dear friend and these guys were just platinum platinum players mm. and the thing is that i was a california record producer i didn't produce by formula so I'd sit down with the guys and we'd look, look at the track, the song and we'd play it through and I marvel because they'd write the charts out in one listen. And then I'd say, so what do you guys think? And they would look at each other and go, wait, did she just ask us what we think? <laughs> I mean, should we do, should we do something 
different or cool or what could we do you know and i also produced all the all my sessions in those days from the room i would get a he set of headphones and a chair i didn't produce from the booth i would go into the room and sit with mm -hmm. them which I just did in Nashville on the on the new on the Herculeons. It was like somebody uh, just asked if uh, so, Tony just asked if you write with your son. Have you and your son written together? Yeah, we all? have. Yeah, we we have, uh, and we're gonna write more. He's phenomenal. Remember the name Abraham Parker because he's he's my father, but with Frank Zappa mixed in, and and he's also a, a great classical musician. He he's a music he's a starving music teacher and an up and coming. He's a monster. I he's he's my dad. He's really got my dad's genes, you know, more than more than I do. Wendy, what was this Warner Brothers brain trust that you were the youngest member of? Tell me about that. When I signed to Warner Brothers in, I signed, well, Maria Moldor from the Queskin Jug Band signed a solo deal producing produced by Lenny Warrenker, and her record came out in 1972. Mm -hmm. um, Ronstadt had just broken out of the Stone Ponies and was doing some little solo records and stuff. But Maria was signed, I guess maybe the Queskin band had been there, but so there was the typical, you know, get, get the chick singer. But Lenny was a brilliant record producer and he had on his label already, he had Randy Newman, he had Bonnie Raitt, he had Ry Cooter. Now he had Maria Moldor. On his affiliated label, I think he had Captain Beefheart and Frank Zappa, who had their own thing, but they were under that umbrella. So, um, and the big money maker there was Black Sabbath. Mm -hmm. So here's all these. Oh, and and then well, no, James was not on that label. He was on Asylum, and that didn't happen yet. But so it was the people, the aforementioned people. And what year is this? 1972. Mm -hmm. So Maria, who knew me through Ken Waldman and had heard some of my songs, mm -hmm. decided to cut two of them. She cut Vaudeville Man and Mad Mad Me. Love that uh, song. On, on her debut record, which sold through the roof and became a huge hit. My producer, Chuck Plotkin, who had been producing Brindle, which had already broken up. Mm -hmm. Chuck and I were cutting some sides of our own to take to Lenny and we cut we cut my version of vaudeville man and we cut a lot of other stuff and um we went to warner brothers mm -hmm. and lenny signed me so my album came out in 73 with the big rolling stone spread singer songwriter debut of the year and all that <laughs> stuff written by stephen holden and that alone has uh, that's why i'm still here it's wow. the only reason because i started out as a critically acclaimed not selling a hell of a lot records um artist and that sort of showed me well i'm gonna be going in that direction i really want to be a really good musician i want to be a good music you know i want to get better mm -hmm. and during the years when i would would be pissed and go well god you know i never became a rock star i would think to myself well now wait a minute what did you pray for when you were 18. did you ever say oh you know Lord on high, I really want to be a rock star. <laughs> and I would have to be honest with myself and say, mm -hmm. well, no. Well, what, you know, self would say, well, what did you ask for? Mm -hmm. I'd like to be a really good musical thinker. Mm -hmm. So did you get what you wanted? It's like, yeah, I kind of did. And I'm no regrets, you know. So that was the brain trust. That's, that's how I got my start. And, and I was, how, how did you go, like, what was the first, what was the first tour? Do you went out with Linda? Where, where did? Oh no, baby. In those days. Yeah. You as a, as an artist on Warner brothers, they mm -hmm. packed you onto an airplane alone. If you were a solo artist like me. Okay. And you flew in my case to East Lansing, Michigan in a blinding snow. And you were met by the field rep who, if you were lucky, would take you to the hotel. And then you would go to the gig and you'd walk in and you'd set up and you'd play your little, you know, song. And, you know, Papa used to tell me as a little child. And you'd be Wendy Waldman. 
And you, there were fans because we were selling records back east a lot. Mm -hmm. And then the next day they would take you to all the distribution centers and say, well, here's, here's where, here's the pressing plant. Here's the distribution center. We're going to three radio stations. By the way, the middle guy hates female artists. <laughs> and I want you to convince him to play your record. So I was touring solo the first year. I went by myself. I had no road manager. I had nothing. I just flew by myself. Rented how, a how old were you? 23. Because the record came out in 73 in, the, in September, and I was 22. Mm -hmm. So I was on the road in, in um, 74, early on. Even, I think, maybe even the winter of 73, I was out. I went to Boston by myself and played Passim's. It was sold out. It was phenomenal. It was Boston because my records weren't typical California singer-songwriter country rock records. There were horns. There was Jackie Kelso and, and, and Jim Horn and, and David Campbell on, on violin and Wilton Felder on bass. These were more sophisticated records. And that's mm -hmm. what Stephen Holden picked up on. Mm -hmm. And it's what I really want. There was all these crazy vocal arrangements and shit. And, and um, it's like, God was looking out for me because I, I've been an idiot most of my life. It's only now in my, like, at the end of my 60s, well, okay, in my early 70s, that I feel like, oh, oh, I'm here. Oh, oh, this is me. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, I can do this. You know, I, I just was like, I would drift through just going, I don't know. I mean, it was horrible. There were many, many horrible years, um, but many blessed years too. And, and so I hit the road solo all through through that, that year. And then the, on the second album, um, I did in Muscle Shoals and I was out with Peter Bernstein. Peter and I hooked up again. And then we toured as a trio. And then finally behind the main refrain, uh, which was my biggest record for Warners. I had a big ass band and we opened for Al Stewart mm. on his year of the cat tour. Mm. And it was, you know, it was fantastic. So, you know, Warners taught you how to be an artist. Mm -hmm. I went into many guys who hate, you know, DJs who were, you know, they would look at you, they would judge your body. They would say, I hate female artists. And you'd go, you know, I would, I got like, I'd ask the, the field rep, well, what's this guy like? Well, he, he really likes Mexico. Like, oh, so you know, yeah, I don't really want, you know, you know, I heard somewhere that you really like Mexico. You know, I lived there, you know, or a guy really likes fishing. And I go, you know, I went fishing. <laughs> I mean, you did whatever you could. You did whatever you could. Mm -hmm. You learned the hard way. And it's that kind of, you know, I am eternally grateful to Warner Brothers for those lessons. They were, it was their own version of grooming an artist in the way that Motown did, mm -hmm. where they took everybody and put them in suits. Warners didn't put us in suits. We were hard-headed, stoned hippies, you know, and we were going to do it our way. But they taught, I'll tell you, you got out on the road and you learned. And you, you learned how to promote records, you know. It's pretty amazing. How about playing us something? I think, I think it's probably I, time I to. think you got to play us something. You asked for this, and I worked it up today on guitar. I actually did cut it once with Artie Traum as a guitar duet, but I hadn't done it for years. So let's see if I can get through it. Here by the fireside, oh, I can see your glowing face. Coming to me After it's over What will there be? Just the breeze Through the lace Like a soft memory Far on a hillside, my soul it does dance With the wonder of knowing we were given a 
chance To know that we took it And gave of our best The poets and the singers Let them tell of the rest Nothing to do but let your wild bird go. Deep into winter, my dream will live on. And the feeling of a wanting, a time that is gone. The silent uncaging of each fleeting thing. To watch it go shimmering as it flies into spring. Nothing to do but let your wild bird go. Thank you so much for singing that. Oh, that was tough. <laughs> oh God. I have to Love get that through song. it, but now you got me going. Now it's like, okay, now I'm gonna do that song all the time. I, I you should. The it's fantastic. Voice. I was telling you before we went on the air that there are like five iconic female voices <laughs> that that just really blow me away. And and you are and Laura Nero is at the very top of my iconic list, and you you are so in that vein and um Yes, I just really appreciate you. You're very kind, considering that I've got massive sinusitis and I've I've, I've got COVID voice. You know, in COVID times, like I'm not singing great. My other artists are singing all brilliantly. I'm like I kind of suck, but I say force of personality. Let you know. Let let's. Get it. <laughs> so so somebody just asked. Uh, Andrew just asked when your next solo CD will be out. Funny you should ask that. I, my my cohort, my co-manager and brilliant partner in all of this, who taught me everything there is to know about the internet, and is is a himself a a really cool sort of alternative record maker with his partner Shy Boy, Mark Newbar and I were talking, and um, he said I really want your record next. I said, okay, I just got one more track. I'm working on the lyrics. Um, I had promised it this fall, but the I had appendicitis and it set me back. 
while I was producing the Herculeons in Nashville, the whole time I was down there, I was sick and I didn't know it. I just was going, man, I got to stop eating so much barbecue. And I got back to LA and, and I, I was sick and I went to the, you know, my doctor, I called my doctor. He said, go to the hospital. I went, why? It's probably a UTI or something. And he said, go to the hospital. So I went and they ran all these tests and they, and the, the doctor came out and she said, well, Miss Nashville record producer, she said, you just produced that, that whole record, you know, 10 days with acute appendicitis. And I was like, where, where is your appendix? Will you please, where was the, where, where is this thing? This appendix thing? Your appendix is sort of, where, where is it? It's just sort of, I've seen pictures of it. It's this little thing that hangs off like a peninsula from somewhere. Come on guys. You, come I on. Think, where, well, where were you in pain? Well, I it wasn't. I thought I had a UTI. I had oh. kind of, I had um, indigestion. I had a mild ache, and I was going, something's not right. I went to my chiropractor. Like I got back on a Wednesday, and I went to her Thursday, and I said, mm -hmm. I'm not. I think I have a UTI. And she looked at me, and she said, Don't, don't even get on the table. She said, You're sick. Go call your doctor. And I went, oh. and she said, No. In fact, call him from here because I don't trust you, because you. <laughs> So by Friday night, I was in surgery. But so it didn't burst, thank God. No, oh, no. Okay. I mean, maybe maybe because I was working out, maybe because I was on <laughs> Weight Watchers, who knows? But thank you, God, it didn't burst. But it, I lost a lot of time. So now the record's going to come out um, spring of next year. And and we're, we're pretty serious. I mean, Mark, is, we're, this is a really neat record. I'm real proud of it. So, so wait, you traveled to Nashville during COVID? during the pandemic? I went how down. Was, how was that? Well, I went down in April to, to produce the Herculeons. It mm -hmm. was an incredible, are you, I wasn't going to pass up a chance to go into Sound Emporium where I used to record with the New Grass Revival and the Forester Sisters. Are you kidding? I had called them up and I had said, you know, you, you probably don't know me, but I used to work out at your studio. Uh, her name's mm -hmm. Wendy Waldman. And they were like, uh, we know you. Mm -hmm. I said, well, you know, I got this act and they want to come in and you know we're we're on a folk budget and and Juanita Copeland who was running sound and for him said I know John Cowan I know Andrea Zahn these guys are these are legendary people and she gave me the deal of the century for sound emporium and it was like coming back home I mean mm -hmm. I, I we were masked Abe went with me we got on the plane and we Okay, on behalf of the COVID crazy, so how was it getting on? You've been living alone, you've been in your house. How was it going into an airport and on a plane and doing all that? It was okay, you yeah. know, because because at, at least at LAX, mm -hmm. you know, you can't move without someone telling you to put your mask on, mm -hmm. especially when you get inside. And we, we got into the gate and of course everybody was fully masked and we, I think there was this, I think I got us aisle seats so that we were a, 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 a part, a, you know, we had some room. And in Nashville, we stayed in Columbia at John and, and Carol's house and we were all masked. We went into the studio and we were seriously masked. I mean, I just read today, Tennessee has the worst numbers in the country. The worst. I'm sure Nashville is not in that don't be so sure. I mean, well, I love Nashville, and it. And I went to University of Nashville in songwriting and record production. But I'm really happy, especially today, to be a Californian. Yeah. Yes. The recall. Thank you, Governor Newsom. We're very right happy on. About right that. on. I'm. I'm proud of our legacy. We are the fifth biggest economy in the country, in the world, and we. We are the home that you go to when you want to figure something out and have some idea and you just don't know where else to do it. And every tribe in the world is represented here. We are the city of the world. People don't realize. They go, oh, L.A. It's like, dude, you got to be made of firm stuff to live in L.A. People used to think we were so laid back because we, you know, we have the sunshine. It's like, have you ever competed with Californians? you know, in the music business, in the film business. Are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. You know, it is a tough place. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people give up and go away. You know, uh, we're, we're still, I think we're still the big, the big hoss in, in the world of, uh, in the creative world. 
we're the 800 pound gorilla. We just, every 20 years we wake up and go, oh yeah, we're the 800 pound gorilla. Roar! And then we go back to sleep <laughs> and we all keep working. <laughs> so Wendy, how did uh, like Earth, Wind and Fire, Cher, Madonna, how did, how did your music get to these people? How did, how did they cover your theme? In a lot of cases it didn't. <laughs> Listen, if if it had gotten to Madonna, baby, I, that's the news I got. I would have no, no. That's okay. Not, so I listened to Sid's introduction of you, and he said that. No, no, no. I okay. I re I was recorded by other, you know, Aaron Neville and by uh, Garth Brooks. Garth Brooks, uh, of course. Vanessa Williams cut a lot of my tunes. Yes, um, and platinum and um, other number one. Yeah, it was that. So was he it. just made that up. He just made those names up. Are you sure they weren't on. They, yes, I listened to Best in the West when he was giving you the award, and he mentioned those names, and I was like, "That's not on her bio. I've got to ask her about that." Well, there's been a lot of records, you know. I mean, I've, I know there have. There's been a lot of records, and I've always worked until I went independent. I've well, I am now still. I've always worked with publishers. Mm -hmm. I was signed to Alma Irving, um, right out. Brindle signed was signed to A and M in like 1970, mm -hmm. and we made a horrible little record. And then God blessed us, and we were dropped. Um, but <laughs> but I was kept as a songwriter for uh, at Irving Almo, and my my guys there were of course the famous Sill brothers. It was Chuck K, rest in peace, my idol. I'm so pissed that he died, and Joel Sill, and they. They were, I cut my teeth with those guys. And then I wound up signed to the old man, to Lester Sill at Screen Gems. And I always had publishers. I was with the brilliant Linda Wartman who ran a publishing company for a brief period of time for Amit. Mm -hmm. And I mean, these publishers, you know, Charlie Feldman at Screen Gems, uh, these, these guys were monsters. You know, they would, Jonathan Stone at Windswept, of course, was fantastic. I was at Windswept many years. And, you know, they would give you a draw and you were supposed to write those hits. And what happened to me was when I wrote with Phil Galston and John Lind, when we wrote Save the Best for Last, mm -hmm. a lot did of you, people... Did you know? Did you know as soon as you wrote it, this is a hit? No. 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 I, I, we wrote Whisper a Prayer, which Alita Adams cut that weekend also. I thought it was a better tune. I, I didn't, you know, I was living in Nashville and, you know, you wrote songs... Can you write on demand? Can they stick you in a room and you will write something with some, with anyone? Oh, oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't guarantee you that someone will record it or I can't tell you about it's the outcome, but of course mm -hmm. I can. I mean, that's, I can write a lyric if you need me to. I can write a track if you need me to. In my old age, I can cut that track now. I can produce it for you. So fantastic. You know, I can I can bring in my guys or I can get, you know, because it's all really fun. <laughs> it's just really fun to make music. It's really a blessing and it's really rewarding. And I studied classical music for the last several years and that was an eye opener. My father was laughing in his grave, just going, I told you so. I told you to go to music school. Why? You know, I finally went and had my mind just totally blown. I mean, how, how amazing. The first thing that, the first art I guess there probably was, was probably cave painting, which now they think were actually women hmm. doing the cave paintings. Cause I took a, drawing class this summer. I took a boot camp drawing class and it was phenomenal. And, and so we were looking at those and so they're thinking that maybe the first cave painters were women. What was the other art? It was singing. It was like you get up and you, you take your little conches and your stones and the fire's dying down and it's raining and we got to like, you know, gods don't, you know, it's, it's, with the overlay of this culture and of the internet and all this bullshit that gets in the way, it's still the same. So how tough was it to learn all the technical stuff, Pro Tools and stuff? Real was that easy? Well, I, by the time I got to Pro Tools, I had already cut my teeth with Studio Vision. And when Studio Vision shut down, I had migrated to uh, Digital Performer, which is a fabulous platform. And then... In 2007, I went through a big life change and I met up with Rob Hoffman, my, my engineer now, who's also, by the way, since, since become a, a major PhD 
uh, medical doctor of Chinese medicine, head of the doctoral program at Yosan in the marina, but he still mixes with me. And he and his first wife discovered Christina Aguilera and cut her first album. And he had also cut his teeth with Michael Jackson. So in 2007, I said, there is no future without Pro Tools. And Michael Boshears and I were arguing about it. Michael and I had worked together for 40 years off and on. And, and mm -hmm. I just said, it, it's Pro Tools. Because I want to be able to get any, any file from anybody in the world and be able to just put it in. And so I struck out on my own. And Rob was a Pro Tools master. And I went, OK, um, uh, I'm going to get Pro Tools. So I started working in Pro Tools in 2007. And I have. It was, Are you self-taught? Did you have help? Oh, I've had. Are you kidding? Nobody's <laughs> self-taught. I have had the most generous fantastic patient teachers, mm. engineers, teachers. I work with a brilliant, brilliant Polish tech here who's now got himself two Emmys uh, named Andrzej Wajocha. And, 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 and I mean, he has, he's so patient. He still mm. can, either, even though he's got two Emmys from, I think, doing the sound on Days of Our Lives, maybe, or As the World Turns, mm -hmm. he still has a few composers that he bails out. You know, us idiots who go, um, I mean, there's literally been, the phone call, like at 11 at night, you know, when Waldman's like, it, it, it's not, it's not working. And I'm really sorry. It's, it's just not working, you know, and, and either Rob or Anja or whoever it was would say, okay, all right, let's calm, calm down a little bit. All right. Now look at the panel. Okay. I'm looking now. Tell me what lights are on. Well, there's no lights on. Okay. There's a little light with a, in a circle that's called power. Could you press that button, please? Done it. It's like, <laughs> oh, turn it on. <laughs> oh, oh, of course. You, you know, I've, I've had tremendous help. And, and it, 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 you know, I worked with Dennis Ritchie, great engineer for many years in Nashville. We were, we were a team like I was with Bo Shears and like I am with Rob now. And it's, you learn so much, you learn together. We've just been doing new mixes on the Herculeons and it's like, we're reading each other's minds. Mm. And I'm so, I am just one of those people. I mean, I'm a studio hound. I was, you know, as a little kid at 22 years old, looking at the horn section, I came in with the charts that Chuck Plotkin said, you have to write horn charts. I, the fuck do I know about? So I would write these, you know, boom, better. Da, da, da. And, and Jim Horn, the great horn sax player, still living and st fantastic. I worked with him many years. He sat me down and he said, I'm going to show you, I'm going to teach you something. This is, I'm 22. He says, I got a red pencil here and I'm going to circle a bunch of things and the, the things in the circle were not going to play. And I said, oh, 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 oh. you know, you're the boss, man. I can't even read music. I mean, barely could read music then. So he circled it and he started teaching me how to write for horns. Wow. It's too much. There's too much stuff there. You know, you don't need all that. Look, we're going to do this. And and the first horn section I worked with was the legendary Los Angeles group. It was Jim Horn, Chuck Finley, great trumpet player, Jackie Kelso on, on Barry sax. You know, I mean, phenomenal players. You, you know, you... I've worked with the greatest. I, I had the experience with Artie, Tr Artie Trom on his last record, Rest in Peace. He said, I want to... We've, like nurtured him because most of the people I produce are writers. So usually there's about a year of writing before we cut, you know, cause they'll come to me and they go, well, I've got these songs and I'll always go, well, can you go back and write some more? I don't think we're quite there yet. So let's, let's, let's push the envelope. Let's write, you know, come back to me with a few more tunes. So we had our song list and he said, I want to, I live in Woodstock. I'm part of the Woodstock family of musicians. I want to cut in Woodstock. And I, Oh, I've never cut in Woodstock. I mean, that's like way up there. We're talking about Tony Levin and, you know, Warren Bernhardt and these unbelievable Woodstockians who, who sit up there in that frozen wasteland and look down on the rest of us. You know? <laughs> and, and, and then I thought to my, I, I remember 
I was so freaked out. I'm like, how am I going to produce? And the, and there's an engineer and he probably, is, I'm going to get the chick production shit that I always get when I walk in there, which is, you know, that's a whole other story. You have to go through this little hoop dance about, yes, I'm a, I'm a girl producer and yes, I know my stuff and blah, 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 blah. So then I thought, you know, when I was producing Bogus, there, there came a day when I had to produce Chet Atkins. Cause he came in to sing on to play on one of Susie's things and mm -hmm. he looked at me and he said what do you want and I, and I so I'm walking around outside the studio in Woodstock going like and then I thought hey dude I've produced Ch Chet Atkins I can do this and I also had a girlfriend on the phone telling me you can do this and I walked <laughs> in I walked in and sure enough the engineer does the the chick you know test the chick which you just you just go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And by the end of it, of course, I love you and I want to work with Aww. you more, you know. And I mean, I had these stunning players. St I mean, I've worked with Tony Levin, you know. I, what can you say? And Artie Traum, and we made a fantastic record. And, you know, I look at it, I go, God, you're such a lucky son of a gun. Look at the people you've worked with. And another chapter is I've been, I worked in Poland and I found all the, the you know, because of meeting Mietek Szczesniak, I met these Polish musicians who, whose stories are incredible. They all grew up under communism. The, the lowliest death metal musician in Poland has studied classical music because it's in their schools, dude. So, wow. but Mietek is a huge superstar there and all of his players are the greatest, you know, I mean, and so, I, for example, Marcin Pospisalski, great bassist and keyboard player and composer and conductor, he's playing bass on half my record. The other half is Carl Seelow. <laughs> so, you know, Pavel Zaretsky, these guys were, it was like going down to Nashville and seeing these great players. And after you've gone into these different places enough times, it's like the content may change, but the form is the same you're walking in you're gonna meet some incredible human beings mm -hmm. and if you come in with the right attitude and you love music and you listen to what they're doing you will have you will make records like nobody's business i mean i might be dead and gone a long time before some people really see how cool some of these records are that's the way life is but the players are what have made all my records incredible because you'd say well, what do you think and and pavel zaretsky or matt rawlings or carl c love or scott babcock or eddie bayers or you know countless paul franklin you name it wilton felder they you know, they they just Cool. So, so it's the collaborative. Pro so you're actually interested in my ideas. It's like, hell yeah, man. Cause you're just going to make it better and better and better. And I, that's how I cut my teeth with, with the best and with Kenny Edwards, you know, who was my music partner, my true brother, but I lost him and I've learned from losing Kenny, Andrew, and my father all within like four months of each other. I learned now, if your band is still alive, go make records. Dan Navarro did this, you know, even after Eric, rest in peace, was mm -hmm. diagnosed. They still made three more records. Mm -hmm. And I got in touch with the refugees and I said, my bad. I said to them, I've realized something, you know, we love to write together. We love to work together. I said, I said, what have we got going for us that some of these other bands don't have? And they said, well, what? And I said, we're alive. Mm -hmm. So how about we, we make records? How about we go to work? And we are. So my last question was going to be if you had a dream of who to work with, but it sounds like you've been living that dream your whole career. Like you're, you've worked and played with. I have the best, right? I have. And, and I'll tell you this, the thing I'm doing now, and I expressed this today to Dan Navarro and Bill Miller, the great Native American three-time Grammy winner, more than me, uh, and dear friend, I said to them both today, I said, I'm now gathering my tribe. There are musicians that I've worked with my whole life, musicians I lost touch with, some great songwriters, 
great players, and I'm just gathering them. We're using the, the our Far West Folk Alliance presentation. Uh, the refugees are doing a set, and then we've got, we're going to have a set from Bill Miller and a set from Dan Navarro and a set from the great Craig Bickhart out of Philadelphia and Ronnie Cox. And, you know, I have friends who are great musicians and writers and performers all over the world. Not all, not rock stars, not millionaires. I mean, yes, Ron's dad is, of course, dear to my heart. Mm -hmm. But wonderful players that I've realized, oh, man, I, I want people to hear these guys. I, I want to play with them again. So I've kind of said, yeah, I'm going to put out my new record. And I'm also going to be making records and doing presentations with all of these people that I love so much. I love it. So somebody else just asked, would you please play a little of Save the Best for Last? I'm going to play before. you Save the Best for Last. Yay. Wendy, yeah. thank you so much for doing this. It's I've been a blast talking it. to you. Sorry, you guys, we talked. We knew we would. Yes. It's Yom Kippur, have. and our, we are of service tonight. Um, two Jewish women. <laughs> we're not in temple, but we're in the temple of service music. So everybody be well. Thank you, Vicki. It was great. Sometimes the snow comes down in June. Sometimes the sun goes round the moon. I see the passion in your eyes. Sometimes it's all a big surprise Cause there was a time when all I did was wish You'd tell me this was love It's not the way I hoped or how I planned But somehow it's enough now we're standing face to face Isn't this world a crazy place? Just when I thought a chance had passed You go and save the best for life times you came to me when some silly girl had set you free you wondered how you'd make it through and I wondered what was wrong with you cause how could you give your love to someone else and share your dreams Sometimes the very thing you're looking for Is the one thing you can't see But now we're standing face to face Isn't this world a crazy place? Just when I thought a chance had passed Go and save the best for last. Sometimes the very thing you're looking for is the one thing you can't see. Sometimes the snow comes down in June Sometimes the sun goes round the moon Just when I thought a chance had passed You went and saved the best for last You went and saved
Wow, phenomenal. Thank you so much, Wendy. Have a happy and healthy new year. And I look forward to all the new music coming from you. And it was wonderful. Namaste. To Love to all. Thank you so much. Have a Thanks, good night. Wendy. Be healthy, all. Bye. Bye.